Hi everyone. In this video, we are going to go over section 7.3 from your textbook, which is about a particular application of the normal distribution in which we're going to look at a set of data, a set of raw data, and not knowing whether the underlying process follows a binomial distribution or a uniform distribution or any of the other probability distributions. We want to be able to assess whether our data follows a normal distribution or whether it's close enough to a normal distribution to be able to use the normal distribution properties when we analyze the data. And so uh, to this end, um, this is what we're doing in, in section 7.3 of the text, and we'll just jump right in here. What I'm about to show you on this slide is that there's actually quite a few probability distributions that mathematicians or statisticians have identified as possibly being the most accurate underlying distribution for a specific random process. And here I've just listed a few of these. If you were very curious about it, you could actually type these into like the wikipedia.org search bar and learn just a little bit about each one. That's definitely not a requirement because in our class, we're just gonna be focusing on these four distributions. And at this point, we've already been introduced to the uniform probability distribution, the normal probability distribution, the binomial probability distribution. And a little bit later in sections or chapters, uh, chapter nine, 10, and 11, we're going to be talking about something called the T probability distribution. So again, you don't have to worry about the rest of these because in this class, we're going to be focusing on these four probability distributions. But my point of showing you these is that, you know, in the real world, things are complicated and you have these random processes that might follow a different probability distribution than you're used to. Right, so there's more possibilities besides just uniform, normal, or binomial. There's actually a bunch of different possibilities that we've identified so far. And some real world chaotic processes are a little bit more complicated than even these, right? And so it would take quite a bit of study um, to really pin down what's happening. I also want you guys to remember that the binomial distribution sometimes looks really, really close to a normal distribution. In fact, we say when the variance is greater than or equal to 10, then we say that the binomial looks enough like the normal distribution to use the normal distribution um, to analyze the data. So remember the variance of the binomial distribution is always n times p times 1 minus p, where n is the number of Bernoulli trials and p is the probability of success for any one of those Bernoulli trials. And I created a little Desmos link here that we can use to look at this and just verify visually that yeah, whenever p is roughly close to a half, somewhere in there between, you know, like 0.2 and 0.8, and if n is large enough, the number of Bernoulli trials is large enough, then what you see here in red, well, that's the binomial distribution. And what I see, what I put here in blue, this being the normal curve, these two actually look very much alike. And over here on the left side of this uh, Desmos page, you can see where I put s squared. Well, that would be the variance. And whenever this variance is 11, you notice that this looks quite a bit alike, like the binomial follows a normal curve quite a bit. And I'll point out too, that even if n is smaller, and the variance here is only like three and a half, you can still see that there's a, a clear, you know, relationship, or there's quite a bit of similarity between the binomial and the normal distribution. And so whenever we say the variance has to be greater than or equal to 10 to equate the binomial to the normal, that's actually a pretty conservative 
number because it starts to look you know pretty similar uh, actually for for a variance that's even less than 10 right but the larger the variance of the binomial distribution the closer it can be approximated with a normal curve as you can see from that visual <clears throat> so what have we said so far? There's a whole bunch of different underlying probability distributions that real-world random processes can follow, but at least the binomial distribution can look normal if the variance is large enough. And I think what you'll find for most, if not all, of these underlying distributions for these real-world processes is that taking some limit in other words, in some particular cases, each of these underlying distributions can also look like the normal distribution. So whenever we say that the normal distribution appears frequently in nature, or the normal distribution appears frequently in random processes that we want to study, sometimes the true underlying probability distribution is something else, but it can be so closely approximated by the normal distribution that we go ahead and we use the normal distribution in the study of that concept because the normal distribution is easier math to work with in most cases. Okay, so having said this, imagine that someone hands you a set of raw data. So they've taken a whole bunch of measurements and they just hand you the set of all the measurements they've taken about this random process. You don't know I mean, let's just suppose that you have no idea whether this data comes from a binomial process or a normal process or a uniform process or whether it comes from any of the other, you know, real world probability distributions that are out there. You have no idea what the underlying distribution of the process is. But someone still wants to ask you, is my data close enough to a normal distribution? where I can use the normal distribution to analyze my data? This is a really important question, and it really simplifies a lot of the work. But in order to determine this, there's a little bit of a procedure, and that's what we're talking about today, is what is the procedure for answering this question? What's the procedure for determining whether your data is normally distributed? So what I've given to you on this slide is a little bit of make-believe. But suppose that that table that contains 20 values right there, suppose that you went out in Africa, in the African wilderness, and you measure the tusk length of 20 different warthogs in centimeters. So the length of a tusk of a warthog is a random process, because until you see the warthog and you measure, you got your tape measure, um, you're not actually going to be able to predict the length of the tusk of the next warthog you see, but we can make statements about the mean of the tusk lengths of the population of warthogs and their variance or dispersion. Um, so in any case, uh, let's say that this is our table of data, and whenever I'm analyzing data, I always pull out Microsoft Excel, and I need to punch in what are these values into Excel. So uh, just trying to use the A column alone, I'll use 27.3, 27. In fact, maybe I can make this easier by copying and pasting. Maybe not, but it's worth a try. Okay, so copying and pasting into Excel has given me um, actually just one cell with all of the measurements spaced apart. So let me show you, if you ever run into this situation, how you can uh, remedy this, right? So what, ideally what I would like to have is each of these measurements in its own cell instead of in all in one cell with a space in between. And so what I'm gonna do is go to, uh, go to data, and then where it says text columns on the ribbon, I'm going to, uh, click delimited. I'm going to use check the box next to space. So each time it sees a space in between numbers, it's going to put the number in a separate cell 
and we'll go to next and then just click finish and that is going to that'll work also I like to sort of deal with my data in columns and this is in a row so I'll highlight the whole thing control C and then in cell A2 I'll do paste and then there's a part of paste that says transpose and so now it's in a, a column instead of a row next I'll select row 1 and then go over here to delete so now I have my 20 measurements of the warthog tusk lengths in a column and an Excel spreadsheet, just like that. So good progress so far. Let's go back to our notes. Here is that procedure I was telling you about. So if I want to determine if this data follows a normal distribution, um, number one, I need to calculate the mean and the standard deviation. That is the sample mean and the sample standard deviation of this data set. That's step one. So uh, here's the sample mean and sample standard deviation. The formula for sample mean is equals average in Excel. And my data is in column A. So I do A colon A like this. The sample standard deviation formula in Excel is uh, stdev.s. And then again, I select my data. So Excel has calculated my mean in sample standard deviation of this data set. Uh, number two, step number two says I need to sort my data from least to greatest. So in Excel, what you would do is you select the column where your data is, go over here on the ribbon under the Home tab to sort and filter, and then we want to sort smallest to largest. Now my data is sorted from smallest to largest. Step number three says I need to index the data. And so I'm going to let lowercase i be my index variable. And i is just going to be the rank whenever I sort this. And so and maybe in column B, I'll put these i values. And so just numbering 1 up to 20. This is going to be the index, or the lowercase i, that's associated with each measurement. So like um, the measurement number 13, or the measurement with index 13 is 27.6. Now, step 4 says for each one of these values, I need to calculate this f. And f is going to depend on i, my index, so each measurement is going to have a different F value. And it will depend on N, which is the sample size. In my case, that's 20. And so let me just follow this formula to generate an F value for each of my measurements. So bring that aside. In Excel, let's put their F values in column C here. And I'll add a little row above just to label these. So my column A is my measurements, which is denoted by x. Um, column b is my index, which I denote by lowercase i. And then column c is what's going to contain my f values. So in column c, the formula for f is going to be in the numerator i minus 0 0.375 divided by, and then in the denominator, n, which in my case is 20 plus 0 0.25. So these are my f values that are calculated for each measurement. Um, and again, the f values are different for each measurement because the i is different for each measurement. So notice my f values are always between 0 and 1. The lowest is going to be just a little bit above 0. And then the highest is going to be just a little bit below 1. So we have successfully done steps 1 through 4 in our procedure. So we can move on to the next slide. Step five says that for each of these measurements, we can generate a value of what that measurement should be if the data followed a normal distribution perfectly. And if this data follows the normal distribution just perfectly, then each measurement should be the normal distribution quantile function evaluated at the point fi.
So where it says QF, this is the normal distribution. Quantile function, QF for quantile function. And we're going to calculate this as well. So going back to my Excel spreadsheet in column D, this is where I'm going to put the QF for the quantile function evaluated at the F value. We'll see how to do that in a second. And then step six says what we're going to do is plot the should be measurements on the vertical axis against the actual measurements on the horizontal axis. So we're going to create a little scatter plot for step six. And my scatter plot is going to look like this. My vertical axis having the should be measurements on, on what we might call the y axis. And then my horizontal axis is going to have the actual measurements. So for any one of these measurements, you have an actual measurement that determines its horizontal position on the scatter plot. And you have the should be measurement, which is going to determine its vertical position. And so we can determine where all of these points belong to. And then I should have at the end, like 20 points sort of scattered around my scatter plot, like so. That's what I should have at the end of step six. Let's look at how to do step five and step six. <laughs> I, I guess I skipped past all of these um, little tips that I made in my PowerPoint, but that's okay. In step five, we're asked to use the normal distribution quantile function. And so in Excel, and by the way, I'm stealing this lecture slide from uh, the lecture 7.1 slides, but so you've, you've actually seen this slide before if you're getting deja vu. But this is the formula I will use for the normal distribution quantile function in Microsoft Excel. So it's going to be equals norm dot inv. And then I put the p, which in our case is going to be the f value. Yeah, let me point that out here. For our case, this p is going to be lowercase f sub i. just for this section in 7.3. And then I put comma the mean and then comma the standard deviation. So that's what I'm gonna use right, right now. <laughs> so for the quantile function, I do equals norm.inv, open parentheses. I put my f value in for the probability. The mean, well, I'll just reference my sample mean over here. And then comma the standard deviation, well, I'll reference my sample standard deviation. But I don't want these to move, so I'll put dollar signs in in front of the G, and in front of the 3, and in front of the 4. And so that way that reference won't move while I fill down this whole column, but the reference to the C column does move to change the F value. And so what this quantile function is telling me is, again, these are what should be the values. And now step 6, I will need to create the scatter plot. And so on the horizontal axis, or my x-axis, what I want is my actual measurements, right? So here, I'm just, again, copying over my actual measurements. And then on the vertical axis, or the y-axis, I want the should-be measurements that correspond to each of those actual measurements. And just eyeballing the data really quick, Notice that those should be measurements, in the case where my data perfectly followed a normal distribution, are just a little bit different than the actual measurements, but they're not, they're not that far off. So just looking at the numbers, it does seem like this is probably going to follow a normal distribution, but let's see what happens whenever I put in the scatter plot. By the way, to put it in a scatter plot in Excel, you go up to the Insert tab on the ribbon, and then you go over here where it says charts and then insert scatter. And I like the first option if you just want the dots. Okay, so here's my scatter plot. And let's go back to our instructions because we're not quite done with our procedure. If you need to do the quantile function in TI-84 calculator, which I don't think we'll need to in this class, but again, um, there is a formula for that as well.
Now, for my procedure over here in step seven, it says it helps to add a trend line. Let's do that. So going back to my scatter plot in Excel, I go over to this green plus sign to add chart elements, and then I click the checkbox next to the trend line, and there's a trend line. Um, so this just shows you how close are these scattered dots to a line or a linear trend. And step eight says, ask yourself, is it linear enough? And if yes, if it's linear enough, it must be normal. And if no, it's not linear enough, then it must not be normal. And to me, I would say that these blue dots are linear enough. And since these are pretty close to forming a line, pretty close to my trend line that I added, then I would say that this data must be coming from a normal process. But, um, you know, this was a, a pretty clear cut case where all the dots were pretty close to the trend line. What if we had a different case where some of the dots were pretty far away from the trend line? Or if the data looked more nonlinear? Well, you might ask the question, what do we mean by linear enough? That's kind of qualitative, and in a math class, we like to be more quantitative. We like to know for sure, determining with some sort of mathematical formula, whether or not this is a yes or a no, whether it's normal enough or not. And so let's talk about how to be a little bit more technical and do this quantitatively. We're gonna calculate the linear correlation coefficient, R, between these uh, data and, and specifically the linear correlation coefficient between the actual values and the should be values. And this is easy using Microsoft Excel. So we type in equals C-O-R-R-E-L. That will give me the linear correlation coefficient if I select um, each column of data and separate those ranges with a comma. And so this is telling me that my linear correlation coefficient is uh, 0 0.986. 0 0.986. And so that's actually really, really good for a linear correlation coefficient. Like if you remember chapter four, and hopefully you do, hopefully you're working on your project, and um, you remember that if it's close to one, that's an almost perfect positive linear correlation. So, Step nine says, we ask ourselves, is my linear correlation coefficient greater than the critical value? And I've provided here on this slide a table of critical values that you should use for R when you're assessing normality. And of course, it depends on the sample size N. These critical values are not the same. Let me repeat, these critical values are not the same critical values that you would use for R if you're assessing a correlation between two variables. Instead, these critical values should only be used when assessing normality. That's super important. So don't use these critical values for other situations. Don't use these for your project, right? Use the ones on your formula sheet when you're doing your project. But when you're assessing normality, this is the table of values you should use. And again, not the same as the other critical values for the linear correlation coefficient. So make sure you know what table you're using and make sure you're using it in the right situation, the right setting. And in our case, we had 20 values because we we're talking about the measurements of tusks for 20 warthogs. And the critical value is 0.951. And sure enough, our critical value of 0 0.98, 0 0.986 is greater than this critical value our R value is greater than the critical value. So that means yes, uh, our data must be normal. Okay, so here's one more data set that we're gonna analyze very quickly. But this table contains the hang time of 20 students. So imagine 20 randomly selected Midland College students are asked to hang from a pull-up bar just like this man is doing. Um, and they're just using a stopwatch and determining how long can the student just free hang from a pull-up bar before their arms get tired and they have to drop. 
And so again, 20 students, we have 20 measurements and some students are very good at this, but most students maybe aren't very good at hanging from the pull-up bar because that's not something not something a typical person usually practices, right? And so let's uh, get back into Microsoft Excel. We're going to look at this and see, I have the same situation as before with my data when I copied and pasted it. So let me do text to columns. I want this to be delimited with a space. And there we go. Now my data is in a row, but I like it in a column. So I'm gonna copy and paste transpose. So I have it in a column. This column A is gonna have my measurements, and then I need a column for my index, and then I need a column for those F values, and then I need a column for my quantile function evaluated at those F values. I'm also gonna end up calculating the sample mean and the sample standard deviation of these x values. And one thing I want to do is sort these from least to greatest. That was step two in our procedure. So there we go, sorted from least to greatest. The sample mean, that formula in Excel is equals average of column A. And the sample standard deviation is stdev.s of column A. So there's my mean and standard deviation. I, my index was just telling me to number these from one to 20, like this. My fi had a specific formula, and to remind you what that formula was, we'll scroll back up here. Um, for each one, we're gonna calculate fi is equal to, in the numerator, i minus 0.375. I minus 0.375, and then in the denominator, it was n, which my sample size in this case is 20, plus something. I don't actually remember what we were supposed to add to 20. Um, let me go back and look. It was supposed to be 0.25 that we add to our sample size in the denominator. So there's my formula for fi. Remember your fi's are between zero and one, always between zero and one. Your lowest should be just barely above zero and your largest should be just barely less than one. Um, and then evaluating the quantile function, well that formula for the normal distribution quantile function in Microsoft Excel is norm.inv, open parentheses, where it says probability, I'm gonna put in my fi values. Where it says mean, I'm gonna reference my sample mean. Where it says standard deviation, I'll reference my sample standard deviation that I calculated. I'm going to go back into this formula and put dollar signs in front of the g and the 2 and the g and the 3 because I don't want those cell references to move as I fill down this formula. I only want the reference to uh, my fi to move. The next thing we want to do here is we want to insert a scatter plot where my horizontal axis is just my actual measurements, and my vertical axis is going to be the should be measurements that um, I would get if my data perfectly followed a normal distribution. And just comparing these two, in this F column I have my actual measurements, and in the G column I have my should be measurements. And you can see clearly, just by looking at the data, that like these values are really far off from each other. I mean, the should be measurements don't look anything like the actual measurements. And so that automatically tells me that this is not gonna follow a normal distribution. But we're gonna continue with the rest of the procedure. I select my data, I go over here to insert, and then scatter plot like this. I'm going to insert a trend line, a linear trend line, just to make it a little bit easier to see. And again, pause and consider that just qualitatively those blue dots do not appear to be following that linear trend line at all. Those blue dots seem to be following a very nonlinear pattern, which again is a strong hint that this is not normally distributed data that I started out with. The last thing we'll do is calculate the linear correlation coefficient, um, which is uh, lowercase r. And in Excel, I type in equals, C-O-R-R-E-L, and then I select my X data, comma, and then I select my Y data, and that gives me an R of 
which you might think is pretty good for an R value of 0.83 if you were just determining if these two values are correlated. But remember, that's not what we're trying to do. So we're not using the normal table of critical values. We're using the special table of critical values that you're only going to see during this lection, sorry, during this lesson on section 7.3. So using this critical values table for a sample size of 20, I'm trying to see if my R value I calculated is greater than this critical value of 0.951. And you can see that it is not. My value of 0.83 is less than 0.95. And so we can conclude that my raw data is not normally distributed. It must follow some other distribution. And just to give you a peek of how I created this data, I actually created it by using, um, oh, this is a great question. <laughs> I made this data a long time ago. I actually created this data, now I, now I remember. I actually created this data using an exponential distribution, which again is a probability distribution that we're not going to study in this class, but just to point out that some processes that you come across in real life um, will follow a different distribution other than the normal distribution. And this whole section 7.3 is about being able to determine if a raw data set is close enough to the normal distribution to use those properties and use those methods as you're analyzing the data, or if the data looks too much not like the normal distribution, in which case we have to conclude that it's non-normal and we won't have access to the same statistical tools that we like to use as we're analyzing data. Okay, good luck on the homework assignment.